Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's webinar, How to Increase TPS with Flash Storage, brought to you by SanDisk and Information We Financial Services, and broadcast by UBM. I'm Michael Krieger, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. First of all, this webcast contains audience polling questions, and they will appear in the slide presentation window. Please complete the poll when they appear and click on the Submit Answer button located on the polling slide window. And we thank you in advance for that. You can also participate in our Q&A by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A text area located to the right of the presentation window, and then click on the Submit button. At this time, we also recommend you disable your pop-up blockers. The slides will auto, uh, automatically advance. You don't have to do anything to do that. You can also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the Additional Resources button located below the presentation window. And if you're experiencing any technical problems, please visit our webinar help guide by clicking on the Help link below the presentation window. In addition, you can contact our Technical Support Helpline, which is also located in the webinar help guide. Now on to the presentation, How to Increase TPS with Flash Storage, discussing today's topic, we have three expert speakers. First, we'll hear from George Gilbert, an analyst for Giga on Research, co-founder and partner for Tech Alpha, uh, which is a management consulting and research firm that advises clients in technology, media, and telecommunications industries. George is recognized as a thought leader on the future of cloud computing, data center automation, and SaaS economics, including contributions to The Economist, as well on his own blog at blog.techalpha.com. We also have with us Steve Hingerhut, who is the Vice President of Marketing for Enterprise Storage Solutions at SanDisk. Steve has more than two decades of IT product strategy and marketing leadership experience with leadership roles at LSI and Intel. At SanDisk, he's the VP of Marketing for their Enterprise Storage Solutions team, as I mentioned. Finally, today we will also hear from Nati Shalom, who is the Founder and Chief Technology Office of Gigaspaces. He is responsible for defining the technology roadmap and vision for Gigaspace's products and for establishing strategic relationships with technology partners. Well, we've got a lot of information to cover today. Let me just quickly go over our agenda, and then I'll turn it over to our first speaker. Uh, George Gilbert, as I mentioned, will be our first speaker. He'll talk to the industry landscape. Then we'll hear about some of the challenges relating to uh, performance and relating to the number of transactions per second how Zeta Scale software can help, and then uh, Gigaspace's app memory extend. So a little detail on that. A lot of great information. So let's turn it over to our first speaker of the day, George Gilbert, Principal Analyst with Tech Alpha Partners and also with Giga on Research. Go ahead, George. Okay, thanks. So once again, my name is George Gilbert. Um, I cover databases for Giga on Research. Uh, my role here is to provide some context for how changes in database technology are driving changes in storage technology and vice versa. It's very much a symbiotic relationship. And uh, so with that, let's take a, a broad look at the emerging applications and the new demands they're placing on uh, databases. So um, basically this is a slide that's uh, showing on one axis uh, increase in data volumes and on, on the x-axis data variety. We're all familiar with the demanding data management requirements of the emerging class of system of engagement applications. But the legacy systems of record, um, these are the integrated ERP and CRM business suite applications, their data sets um, uniformly fit into highly structured tables and the data volumes for these uh, mainstream systems were pretty much in the hundreds of gigabytes, except for some of the very large ones. Now, by contrast, systems of engagement, they capture an unending sort of real-time stream of events about a richer variety of consumer interactions, as well as observations about everything going on around these consumers to provide context to the application. So the volume and variety and the velocity can be hundreds to even thousands of times greater or more in terms of the data. Um, now, these applications are very much pushing the boundaries of databases, both in terms of volume and velocity. And we'll take a look at that in the next slide. 
So databases have always had trade-offs between performance and capacity. And we've seen an, an emerging class of scale-out uh, new SQL and NoSQL uh, disk-based databases that definitely have the ability to deal uh, with the more demanding data velocity. But disk-based databases have always been bound by I.O., the input-output um, channel to the disk. And as we saw in the last slide, keeping up with the new velocity demands of data is getting ever more difficult because these applications have so much greater uh, uh, data, data volume and data velocity requirements. So there's only so fast a disk head um, that reads and writes data can move. Um, so let's take a look and drill down on that a little more. The obvious question on this next slide task is, so why did databases rely on hard disks for so long? Um, mainstream databases used hard disks because of the underlying storage economics. Most database architectures still reflect the storage price performance assumptions that are 10 to 30 years old. The design of actually most relational databases was uh, are very much descended directly from the original research project that was done in the 1970s. In this world, memory was scarce enough to be used only as a cache, and everything else was organized to squeeze performance out of the hard disk. Now, the emerging economics of Flash uh, is changing all these assumptions so that Flash can substitute for a lot of the capacity that would formerly have required um, hard disks and now at similar uh, price performance uh, levels. Now, if we take a, a closer look, we can actually see um, even greater growing limitations of hard disks, um, and then, then it's easier to see the growing attraction of flash. With databases, um, the role uh, of the hard disk traditionally has been to keep uh, feeding the CPU with the data that it's working on. But CPU performance, as we all know, has been on a Moore's Law curve, um, increasing 100 times uh, in performance per decade. So if we look back just 20 years, it's 10,000 10, times. But by contrast, since hard disks are mechanical, their performance in terms of reading and writing data to disks has only grown incrementally. Now, to be fair, the capacity has grown, but the, uh, the rate at which it can uh, read and write has not grown anywhere near that level. I guess the problem, George, is they just can't spin fast enough. And, and uh, you know, you reach a point anyway. I mean, this has always been my, my issue in IT in all the years I've been there. It's the things that spin, those motors, are what are going to give you grief. So yes, and it's, bound, a drive's bound to fail eventually. It'll fail. Yes, and it's and it's that's thank you for that lead in to the next slide, which is basically that um, there's it's a combination of how fast the platter is spinning and how much time it takes the disk head to find the right sector to read. And so if you look at this slide, you'll see, and this this is really graphic. You drill down on this performance gap between the CPUs and the hard disks that we saw in the last slide. You can see a better picture of the problem. So. The hard disk capacity keeps growing, um, but it takes geometrically longer to read and write the data. So um, that is, when you use the hard disk to find various bits of data, this is called random read. If you just use it like a tape drive where um, it just spins and the head doesn't really move, it just keeps reading what was, uh, what's coming next, that's called sequential. Uh, reads or, or writes, and that that actually has increased um, uh, fairly substantially. But it's databases need to use the random access. So now, if you look at a mainstream disk in 1985 that had 30 megabytes of capacity, um, it took 10 minutes to read all the data in in random fashion, uh, which is what a database primarily does. Um, now, a mainstream disk in 2009. Um, which was the last uh, data point that I found. Um, so that had 500 gigabytes in capacity. It took 58 days versus the earlier 10 minutes to read the whole disk. Now, 
so it's harder and harder for hard to, to support the random read write needs of a database. The kludgy solution, that's a technical term, has very much been to employ ever greater numbers of hard disks in parallel, but that's expensive both in CapEx and in power consumption. Now just to be clear, the assumptions here were that in, in uh, this gets a little technical for those who want backup on this two months number, it assumes a 10 millisecond latency to move the, the drive head, 100 megabytes per second to transfer, and one kilobyte uh, uh, block sizes. Right, and, and I think, George, if you were to fast yeah. forward to 2014, you can get a five terabyte drive, uh, uh, you know, relatively, relatively inexpensive, but you're talking, you know, close to 10x the, uh, the capacity today, so you're talking, you know, many months, greater than a year, so it's just, it's not feasible to use uh, that much capacity for, for random access. Right. The, the problem is only getting worse. And so the, the conclusion is actually pretty simple. Um, because we now have another storage medium that has uh, uh, competitive um, price uh, for capacity and even better price performance, we now can build systems with a more balanced mix of storage that includes more memory uh, and more flash. And actually, we're probably going to be seeing um, hard disks move to more of an archival role, similar to, to tape, and how that how that played a role. So with that, let me uh, turn it over uh, to Sandus folks. Okay. Before that, let's put our audience to work with our first polling question of the day. I'd like to uh, invite all of you to participate. What are your plans for real-time analytics in your enterprise? Are you already using them, evaluating them? Do you have future plans for real-time analytics or no plans at all? And you know, this is one of the, the big areas, I think, that um, you know, when you talk about the adoption of Flash is, is this demand now for real-time everything. Um, and we've seen the, the move from descriptive analytics of the past to predictive analytics um, and, and big data solutions today that um, require us to look at all these transactions. Is this one of the big drivers? for um, people looking at uh, in-memory solutions or, or flash solutions that are faster. Yeah, exactly. And that's, uh, you know, SAP HANA is one, one example mm -hmm. where they're combining analytics and transa transactions in the same platform. Uh, Oracle certainly has a lot of uh, investment there, 12C, uh, really driving that in-memory uh, in memory compute for real time responses, but yeah, I definitely see the the business drivers around this right when you have big data how do you how do you get access to that? How do you turn that into information that you can make decisions on in in a timely manner so that 's where real time analytics is becoming more and more popular and looking at the results of our study we 've got about uh, twelve percent who are using another ten percent actively evaluating most of us have them uh, plans for in real-time analytics in our future, uh, a third of us or so say uh, not yet. And with that, I'll turn it, um, well, let me ask you, Steve, is this uh, kind of where you, you see the, the market at today when you talk to your customers? I think this is pretty, uh, this, seem, this isn't surprising, let's put it that way, that I think basically two-thirds of the, the, the people on the call here are uh, either using, evaluating, or planning to use real-time analytics. And and, you know, we can talk about some of the challenges, right? It is, uh, it, it can be expensive. Uh, it, it can require some some major investments. So we want to see what we can do to to make that easier. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead. Very good. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, George and Michael, for that uh, introduction. So once again, I'm Steve Fingerhut. I work at Sandisk, uh, and some of you may be wondering, um, you know, you haven't heard of SanDisk, you don't think of SanDisk when you think about transactions per, per second, uh, databases, analytics, that type of thing. So uh, wanted to introduce SanDisk, that we are a, a significant player in the enterprise SSD space. So SanDisk is a, is a Fortune 500 company, uh, has $6.5 billion in revenue over the last year. And you probably know us from uh, buying camera cards or USB sticks. That's a, a, a successful consumer business. But really, 
uh, two-thirds of SanDisk businesses is B2B, so more of a commercial sale uh, focused on enterprise. And um, we have been growing significantly, particularly in the server and storage SSD uh, space, and we are proud to have uh, you know, six of the seven top server and storage OEMs as, as our customers today. Uh, and, and that number is growing. So all of the HP, Dell, IBM, the, the names that you know and trust and probably buy from are, uh, are using SanDisk products. And in fact, if you've bought a SaaS SSD in the last two to three years from some of those top vendors, uh, the chances are very good that it, you are using a, a SanDisk SSD. Um, we've certainly broadened our portfolio as well with SATA SSDs and uh, just last week, we completed the acquisition of Fusion IO, which maybe is a uh, name familiar to many of you, and they've they've developed a uh, really a leading application acceleration product line uh, built around PCI Express. So, really, SanDisk is the uh, really the the leader with the broadest portfolio, as well as uh, we manufacture our own our own uh, NAND memory, which puts us in a in a unique position in the industry. So I wanted to introduce the, uh, a framework to talk about analytics. So our polling question was around real time, but there are several, uh, several categories of, of analytics. And just uh, you know, introducing you to the structure here, there's what we call synchronous data analysis or asynchronous. That's on the, uh, the left-hand side, and that really is about is this, is this your live data that you're polling or that you're analyzing, or is it something that you've, you've taken a, a snapshot of and are analyzing somewhat offline? So synchronous is, is the live data. Uh, and then what's the size of the data that's on the bottom? Is there, are you analyzing gigabytes of data, terabytes, or petabytes? And then on the right-hand side, it's how, how uh, fast do you expect a response? And as George mentioned, you know, the larger the data set, the longer it's going to take. That's been the traditional trade-off in, in database. Um, but we're obviously trying to to um, eliminate those trade-offs. So if you if you walk through the boxes clockwise, uh, stream analysis in the upper left, that's really uh, companies. Uh, a lot of web companies will use this technique to analyze clicks for the day or, or response time on pages to to identify performance challenges or or user patterns, or certainly in the financial community uh, to analyze ticker data and look for uh, look uh, develop stock strategies. Uh, operational analysis is more the traditional uh, ERP systems where you're running SAP or JD Edwards, and you're, uh, you might have a nightly batch job or, or a, a daily report that, uh, that a user generates, but that's on you know, gigabytes of data. Um, <clears throat> and then batch analysis, and these are shades of, shades of gray here, uh, but you know, true batch analysis where you might be analyzing multi-terabytes of data or even getting into petabytes of data. That's where you start uh, seeing some of these new tools like Hadoop uh, uh, come into play. And uh, so that's really our framework. And of course, the objective is to, uh, you know, everybody wants the ultimate goal is real-time analysis. Can I have large data sets get real-time results? And, um, and if not, you know, get all the way up there, get closer uh, from a performance perspective. And really, the, the objective is to, to drive business uh, results and make real-time decisions. And so why don't we put everyone back to work with our second polling question of the day. You've heard some of the challenges that Steve's been talking about. Which of those workloads give you the most challenge, give you the most grief? Is it the stream analysis performance? Is it the uh, operational analysis response time, the batch job completion time, or real-time analysis cost? And you know, I always remember um, Steve running out, of, running out of hours in the day to get the batch jobs done back when you know I was doing transactional uh, work and uh, back in my mainframe days it, it seemed like between the, the backup job and the batch job uh, you know if we just had a couple more hours in the day that would have been great um, you know, but times have changed now when we're doing more stuff uh, real time streamed we have new data modes we have new ways of collecting information um, what do you see as the evolution? I mean, where is this all going? Are we all, are we moving towards that upper right-hand corner or the real time? Well, I think, and George had a great framework for this. It's uh, and I, I worked on the same uh, the same environments, right? You try to get your clothes done before uh, you know your your sales order entry people come in the next morning, exactly. and uh, 
but now it, that's the system of record. Now it's really moving to that, you know, IT instead of becoming your back office is your front office. So you're, you're driving your business off IT, so faster response time could mean more revenue, more users, uh, and, and your, your business could succeed or fail based on the response time. So I, absolutely I think, uh, you know, you're seeing the need for uh, these types of real-time analysis growing. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's reflected in what we're seeing in the numbers here with uh, fully a third. Say it's the real-time stuff that's giving them the biggest headache. That still leads, but uh, that's not a shock. We still have uh, uh, what's a trillion lines of COBOL. It's hard, it's hard to say it's wrong. Um, so there's a lot of that old batch <laughs> transaction stuff that's still, still out there. Uh, but you can see in, in today's uh, attendees, uh, obviously, that shift is occurring. Yeah, absolutely. This is... Uh I'd say not surprising that batch jobs continue to vex uh, uh, the folks on the phone here. That's um, uh, you know, as data sets grow, trying to get those completed in a in, in your window is uh, is a challenge. Gosh, I remember when a terabyte was a lot. Now it's you know in my TiVo, and with that, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> so we want to double click on this. You know why why uh, why is it such a challenge to to scale and get to real time uh, analytics and George uh, did a great introduction about the, the core technologies uh, uh, underneath it in the hard drive. But if we, if we look up the stack now, uh, there's other layers. So the uh, hard drive has been around since the, the 1950s, and databases, operating systems, file systems are all optimized to overcome that. And how, do, how can they deliver a, a sequential uh, read or write instead of a random read or write, those types of techniques. Um, great when you have a hard disk in place, but uh, with with such slow hard drive performance or storage performance, your uh, the application just can't scale. <clears throat> so, um, and then what we're doing, and uh, what what many others are doing, is replace the hard drive with with an SSD, a solid state disk, and uh, you know the challenge is that the uh, you know, the SSD can provide significant performance increase. We can see 50 to 100 times greater performance from an SSD uh, very, very easily, but you may not see that type of performance scaling. Um, and the reason is that further up the stack, the, there's a bottleneck further up the stack. So the database, the operating system, needs to be optimized for the much higher performance of an SSD. <clears throat> and... Uh, SanDisk has a new software product we just announced a few weeks ago that really the goal is to treat flash like memory. So allow a, a highly parallel access, more, more of that random access that uh, across large, a large data set size that George mentioned um, to greatly increase performance. So um, we see this as a, uh, uh, you know, really a, a key enabler of um, of acceleration with, with any flash, right? Certainly SanDisk uh, develops and markets uh, SSDs. Uh, we have a, even a DDR-attached SSD for, for the very highest performance solution. Uh, now with Fusion, we have uh, PCI Express. But, you know, any, anybody's solution uh, will, will work with this software. And we think it's important because while we think we have the best products, we know that, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why somebody may uh, decide to choose another another vendor, and we want to make sure there's a flexible. It's a flexible architecture to scale with your with your needs. So, wanted to spend a little more time talking about Zeta Scale. So, this is an intelligent and efficient way to access flash storage in anybody's. So, uh, we we took a look at a, a very popular uh, analytics tool that uh, you know, NoSQL is probably a term that, that everyone's heard. This is a way to access this unstructured data that George talked about, uh, um, maybe um, uh, your, your web pages, the objects on your web page, uh, this, this clickstream analysis. It may be that exactly how it's structured is, is dynamic, right? You, you don't want to be locked in in advance, and you want to look for patterns in the data that uh, you, you may not have uh, been able to foresee with a with a clear database schema. Um, so Cassandra is a very popular tool for, for NoSQL environments. And this chart shows that 
simply upgrading from hard drives to SSDs, that's the, the left and the, or the first and the second red bar, uh, drives a significant increase, a, four, a 4x or 400 percent increase in performance, and this is measured based on uh, transactions uh, per second. And um, so that's a, that's a great benefit, and what we're seeing is a lot of companies just go straight to a, uh, when they have a NoSQL environment or Cassandra environment, they just go to, to SSDs. The, the, the performance benefit is, is significant. Um, however, the data is growing so fast. We've talked to customers that, that talk about their NoSQL implementations growing 700% a year or 1,000% a year. And how do you keep up with that, right? They didn't budget for that at the beginning of the year. How do you continue to scale with, uh, with those types of growth numbers? And, um, <clears throat> and what you need is you need more performance out of a given server. So with Zetascale integrated into the Cassandra tool, you can then get even more performance out of the exact same hardware. So this is the exact same server and uh, an SSD array and you can get an additional 2x improvement. And we have a lot of these other benchmarks on our website, which you can uh, look at it, um, and you know, different applications. But you'll see similar types, of, uh, similar types of performance increases. And then you know, that has many benefits. So the first is just the ability to, uh, you know, in a given server, uh, run more. If you have an existing investment, upgrade your software, you get more performance. Uh, the other is as you're scaling, if you are encountering these types of rapid growth uh, rates from, from big data, uh, your, your data scientists or your analysts want to keep the data around. They never want to delete anything because you never know, right? You might be able to get a better prediction by going back more years. So you want to keep that data. You want to continue to scale, um, but how to do it in a cost-effective way. So this actually shows what you can do with that performance improvement is to, is to deliver consolidation. So if you're uh, you know, stock SSD over uh, over a hard drive array can deliver a you know 5x type of improvement. Um, and even if you're using all SSDs, Zetascale software can then drive an additional 3x per improvement over uh, you know over an all SSD array. Which the chart on the right shows what that means from a capex and opex reduction. You can you can cut that cost in half, which you can either use to stay inside of your budget or to uh, to grow your to grow your environment to keep up with more data. <clears throat> so, just in summary, then Zetascale really helps solve this major problem with a significant transaction scaling. It's uh, it's cost effective way to move from analyzing gigabytes of data to terabytes of data or even petabytes of data. Uh, then you obviously can realize TCO benefits. And then finally, you're looking for all the advanced uh, data management features as well to make sure your, your data is safe and where you need it, when you need it. And those are all inherent in the Zetascale software as well. So then our, our goal here, and we have a, a build on that slide we presented earlier, but you see with this we can move the applications from, uh, you know, you can either grow the data set size, so you can in-memory database, you can keep that millisecond response time, but now you can easily manage terabytes of data instead of being stuck in gigabytes of data. Or um, if you're looking for same data set size, but you just want it faster, you can move closer, uh, and it could be uh, milliseconds instead of seconds, uh, hours instead of days, or uh, that type of scaling. So if you are interested to find out more, we have the Sandus.com Enterprise site, and our Zetascale, uh, our Zetascale page has more information. You can download white papers, uh, more, more information. I, I know there's a lot of questions uh, queuing up, but uh, hopefully we'll get to those. And uh, you can also just find more on the site itself. Uh, you can also apply for a, a free evaluation of the SDK or the development kit. If you're a software developer or if you have a significant uh, application then that, that you think could benefit from this, please, uh, please go out there, uh, sign up, and let us, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with you to see what, if this is a good fit. So really appreciate the 
time and attention to introduce SanDisk and our new Zetascale products. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, <clears throat> the Gigaspaces. We've worked closely with Gigaspaces. They are a leading middleware company in distributed computing. They have integrated the Zetascale software into their product, the, the Zap product, which uh, Nadi will introduce, uh, for in-memory applications. So uh, really, but with that integration, they've achieved some, some great results, and i um, excited to hear what Nadi has to say. And before we turn it over to Nadi, let me, yeah, Nadi, before we uh, give it over to you, let me um, remind the audience they can submit questions at any time. We'll get to as many of them as we can. Also, you can download a copy of the presentations for your own on-demand viewing. And Nadi, would you like me to run the poll before we turn it over to you? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Absolutely. So once again, and hopefully for the uh, last time today, well, now we will ask you for our survey. We're going to put all of you to work. What are your plans for in-memory computing? And we've been talking about this a little bit with tools um, um, such as SAP HANA that are doing more and more in-memory. Are you using tools like that today? Are you actively evaluating uh, in-memory solutions? Do you have plans uh, to do so in the future or no plans at this time? And, and Nadi, what do you see? I mean, you're in the middleware business. People are looking at getting more, more performance out of everything they do and connecting things. Are you seeing more demand for in-memory computing from your customers? Yes, definitely. I think that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in-memory has been in demand for a long time. Uh, that's not necessarily a new category. Uh, but with the demand for real-time analytics, that's uh, changed quite a bit of things, and uh, people want results uh, faster, and the segment of marketing, I think, is uh, driving uh, quite a lot of that. Uh, also, the fact that uh, people want to you know, reduce the cycle between you know, getting the insights to uh, real actions on those insights, that's another thing that drives that uh, real-timeliness. It looks like it's a, it's a technology that's new to our attendees today, and we have uh, just a few people who are using it today, but a lot of them have, have it in their plans. Over half either are using it or plan to use it. Um, I, I think maybe the reason there, there's no plans for so many is the fact that it's it's not well understood yet, would you say? Or, um, I think that there are actually a couple of reasons, and that, that, that's not surprising. One is uh, it's not well understood, but uh, one of the gaps, uh, there is a, a big technology gap in terms of memory, and that is related to cost and capacity, and that's basically what we're trying to solve here. And I want to thank everyone for participating in the polls, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nati to continue. Go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, so, uh, quick introduction. Uh, about gigaspaces. Actually, the, the interesting part is that we're not uh, a regular database company, as you would uh, imagine. Uh, we're actually coming from the point in which we realized the bottleneck of, of disk for a long time. Uh, we uh, exist in the market for 15 years and developed an in-memory distributed computing uh, technology uh, back then to solve that problem. So we're very early on on identifying it. And, and, uh, and uh, a part of the uh, uh, things that we've done is really created uh, uh, and used ROM-based devices to deal with that challenge. And as you probably know, there's a big difference between ROM and, and, uh, and disks uh, in terms of performance and latency. Uh, so as a, as a personal note, uh, the thing that actually brought me to SanDisk was the fact that uh, uh, SanDisk really provided not just the regular, if you'd like, uh, faster storage, they actually provided a way in which we could interact with that storage directly from uh, the in-memory database that, that, that we provide. And in a way, you can think about what we're doing is, uh, is, uh, is the, uh, an in-memory database that has the consistency of a relational database, but the scaling of the kind of NoSQL that I think Steve was uh, talking about. Uh, so, so the challenge that uh, we had, and, and again, that's kind of the reasons that uh, brought us to uh, integrate with, uh, with SanDisk, was that uh, when we uh, uh, developed the in-memory database, or in-memory uh, data grid as it is called, uh, we're really facing uh, the potential of the memory in terms of performance, but we're reaching the limit of capacity. And the limit of capacity uh, was in cost, uh, because RAM in itself is uh, relatively uh, more expensive than regular disk, and the difference can be uh, quite uh, uh, big in terms of uh, cost per gigabyte. And the second challenge was technology challenge in terms of the JVMs uh, handling uh, large capacity and so forth. So if you really wanted to run 
uh, big data analytics on in memory de devices, you either uh, run very large clusters, which uh, tends to be uh, relatively uh, costly, or uh, you're, uh, um, or you're uh, getting to the point in which uh, you're hitting the memory uh, limit of that machine, and that in itself was, uh, was a challenge. But uh, in, it, in itself, the core value that the in-memory computing uh, provided uh, remains the same. Uh, so really, the problem that we were trying to solve here is how can we address and provide the value of in-memory computing to bigger data, to bigger amount of data, to the big data market, uh, as, uh, as uh, we'll describe in a second. And, and so for us, uh, the, the real benefit, uh, and for the uh, customers, the, and, and that's, uh, again, I think, uh, correlate very nicely with the, uh, with the poll that was here, uh, it's really about the ability to get better cost performance. And uh, better cost performance, uh, we're talking about significant uh, ratio uh, on that regard. And uh, uh, so it's the, the ability to lower the cost by the fact that we can actually run per node a higher capacity it's also the ability to do that without sacrificing performance dramatically because the difference still between memory and disk uh, was, uh, uh, was too far. Uh, the mismatch between, the impedance mismatch between memory and, uh, and disk was too far and, and therefore we couldn't really just integrate with regular disk as it was before. The fact that we can actually have a performance that is much closer uh, to RAM in terms of latency and transaction per second was a big enabler. Without it, we couldn't really get to that point and integrate with that. And that, that's the thing that actually enabled us to even present those slides and talk about the, the, the gain in performance and capacity. So from a technology perspective, uh, the way it looks like, I mentioned earlier on uh, that the architecture is very similar to NoSQL from a scaling perspective. And, and, and in that regard, the way it works is that we have multiple processes uh, that represent the memory or the capacity of each device, each server that is running, and uh, we have a way to view all those servers uh, that represent that capacity uh, as if it was one big database. That's in a nutshell the way it is architected. And each of those nodes have a replica. Uh, for redundancy, which means that if one of the nodes fails, the data doesn't go away. It will still be uh, remaining somewhere in the network, and from a user perspective, we'll do the routing to the alternative node uh, if we'll detect the failure. So from a user perspective, the availability uh, is kept uh, pretty much transparently. It doesn't need to do anything uh, related to that. The change that we've made to the original ZAP product that we had was the integration with SSD uh, in a way that uh, the RAM is now have an extension to SSD. From a user perspective, that extension looks like a big RAM. So it doesn't really know that there is an SSD behind the scenes. You just see a bigger capacity uh, per node in this specific case, and I'll show some numbers that shows how big that capacity is. We also wanted, and that's very different than the other integration that we've seen, we wanted to keep the same semantics uh, same performance, same APIs, pretty much the same. So, uh, uh, so it will be uh, completely transparent from a user. He will really get uh, the performance benefit, but he wouldn't be limited in terms of features and even the range of queries and consistency, all the things that he's experienced uh, when we were working uh, with ROM-based devices. Uh, the other part that I think is very important is the in integration with uh, uh, other databases that is also kept implicit. Uh, so usually people using uh, the ZAP product as a front end to databases uh, now in the context of real-time analytics to their Hadoop system. And the way it works is that we usually load data uh, back and forth from that external data sources. And by means of back and forth, that means that if I'm uh, initiating a ZAP cluster, it will uh, sync with the backend data store and will initial initialize itself from that data. And it will also, whenever I'm making an update, uh, the update itself will be stored in the in-memory database, in the ZAP uh, portion of that uh, 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 user, and that will be synced asynchronously uh, into the backend databases. Uh, so from a user perspective, that integration is also implicit. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't need to wait 
for that synchronization to happen, it doesn't need to uh, be blocked uh, for that synchronization from a performance perspective. And that's how we keep the performance much closer to run, even though the data gets synced uh, in the background uh, with the external data sources. Uh, so again, the important aspect here is that the user uh, is not exposed, uh, not in feature, not in uh, change in the functionality, and very little in performance uh, from the fact that we're now using SSD. The real thing that he's going to experience is much bigger per capacity per node, and obviously uh, the cost per gigabyte is uh, significantly lower. Uh, and uh, Nadi, uh, just, a, yeah. just a question: uh, what, what types of, uh, you know, with that new capability, the larger the larger data set size, what what types of, uh, you know, use usages would do you think that will open up? So I think that the main usage is the big data analytics. Uh, previously to that, we were mostly used in uh, in financial risk systems and uh, and uh, e-commerce systems. Uh, mostly in the, if you'd like, the transactional part of those uh, systems. Uh, with the move to big data and with the uh, range of capacity that we're talking about that I think uh, Steve and George presented earlier, uh, we're talking about petabytes of data. Uh, obviously, if you want to run real-time analytics, not on transactional data, but on analytics data, uh, we're talking about petabytes. And, and obviously, petabytes and storing petabytes uh, on a traditional ROM uh, wasn't something that most people would be able to afford. Uh, so that really opens up the entire real-time uh, big data market for us uh, to a large degree. Great. Thanks. Okay. So from a technical details, uh, what, we, what we get uh, out of that, and I think in a, in a nutshell, the way I kind of describe it is that you get the consistency of a relational database and the scaling of a NoSQL database uh, that's one aspect to look at that, but from an analytics perspective, that means that you could actually do uh, complex query, transaction, replication. And, and the, the other aspect that is uh, very unique to Gigaspace is the fact that I can actually push code to the data. Uh, and the fact that I can push code is, is very important because memory and RAM, unlike disk, for example, lives already in the address space of the application. And I can take advantage of that. So I don't need to go back and forth and transform the data and serialize it and deserialize it whenever I want to bring the data back and forth to the application itself. And that's a very big advantage. So if I can collocate the data of the, uh, and, the, and the business logic of the application on the same node, obviously that means that I don't need to go through that serialization uh, and I can actually access the data by reference, especially for read operation. Uh, and that's uh, another advantage that we have here. Uh, the other advantage is the one replication. Uh, we're seeing that as another big differentiator. Uh, one replication means that we can actually build clusters, especially in a cloud-based environment, that span across data centers, availability zones, and keep them up to date, and still dealing with the, uh, you know, with the reliability of networking uh, as it appears in those type of environments. So DR type of deployments is very common but also a regular multi-site deployment to reduce the latency. So for example, if I have a New York, Tokyo uh, kind of uh, uh, deployment, uh, I uh, can uh, cache the data closer to the user, closer to the front-ending uh, part of, the, of my application so that the user will get local latency rather than uh, remote latency. So in terms of the actual uh, uh, cost saving, uh, we're talking about 80% and, uh, and, and that's uh, a number that we're actually derived uh, from the actual benchmark itself, and I'll explain why we're getting to that number. And, and in terms of uh, the size of data that we can actually uh, uh, store, we're talking about an increase of a factor of 100 uh, per node, and that's huge. Uh, so we're moving from, uh, imagine uh, that previously when I described uh, the capacity limit that we had before, we were talking about uh, 30 gig in, in average, uh, per node, and now we're talking about one terabyte of data per same no per the same node. Uh, so you could appreciate the difference. It's it's a it's an order of magnitude, a couple of order of magnitude differences from what people used to experience uh, before in a RAM only solution. Uh, putting some numbers behind it, uh, as you could imagine, a pure RAM solution would still be faster than uh, than a flash access, but the difference is uh, is less significant than it was before. 
which in average gives us the ability to really use uh, and get to the point where we could use the SSD as an extension of RAM. And if you coupling the remote access to that and the networking uh, overhead, the user wouldn't feel that much of a difference in terms of the actual performance. And if I couple that difference also with cost, uh, then obviously I can compensate on the difference in performance uh, with the fact that I can actually push much more data on that same node as you've seen before. Uh, so, so from a cost perspective, what we're getting is a, is a, is a two times uh, better performance than uh, we would get, uh, or three times actually uh, better cost performance than we would get with the uh, original configuration, which was pu purely uh, RAM-based. And, and by the way, that, that, could, that number, is, I believe, uh, could be even uh, much higher. Part of the reason, and that's the important thing, is that uh, the type of integration that we've done is integrating with Zetascale, which basically enables us to bypass the disk uh, interface. And the fact that we can bypass that gives us uh, not just the performance benefit, but it really simplifies the, the, the integration. Because when you're using disk as a key value store, you don't need to uh, uh, deal with it, all the overhead of uh, uh, doing all the marshalling and non-marshalling and also all the heap management that other uh, technology had to deal with when storage was just a block device. So for us, the fact that there is a, a key value interface that is indexable as well and gives us a much higher level of integration simplified the integration work quite a bit, and that was a, another big enabler, uh, something that enabled us to push that integration much faster than we would normally do if we would do it with a regular uh, block-based uh, interface. And so uh, Daddy, kind of yeah, Daddy, this is uh, maybe a follow-up question there. So you're you're describing the uh, the cost savings, right? And this is on a uh, you know similar data set size, correct? Between those two charts. Yes. yes. So how does that uh, you know the other? They can certainly help you reduce the cost for an existing uh, you know a, a set a fixed data set size. So what does this mean in terms of the ability to? grow the working set size that you actually are analyzing in memory? Yeah, so uh, the Zap product is a, a scale out, has a scale-out architecture, and uh, that means that uh, if now I can uh, handle one terabyte of data per node, uh, that means that I can easily scale out to multiple uh, nodes mm -hmm. and actually get more and more nodes in the system, and in that case, increase the capacity uh, through that scale-out architecture. Makes Does sense. that answer your question? Yeah, it makes sense. No, thank you. Okay, with that, I think it's time to get to our Q&A, but before we do that, I'd like to put you all to work for one last time. Please fill out the feedback form that has opened on your computer. To complete the form, just press that Submit Answer button at the bottom of the page. I thank you in advance for completing our feedback form. Your participation in our survey allows us to better serve you. And with that, on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder to participate in the Q&A, just type your question into the text box located below the media player, then click the Submit Question button. We've got a bunch of questions already lined up in the queue, gentlemen. So let me start, Nati, with the questions for you. This comes from uh, Michael, who wants to know, on the Zap platform using Zap Memory Extend, how large can my data set be? So I mentioned that the, uh, each node can be terabytes of data, and uh, Zap can extend to hundreds of nodes uh, okay. easily. Uh, that's, that's the way it's scaled even today. Uh, so we basically scale by increasing the capacity per node. Terrific. Thanks for that, and keep the questions coming. Steve, this question comes from you from Evan, who says, will Zetascale software be embedded in SanDisk SSDs? It's a great question and uh, something we get a lot. Uh, it, I guess we, I wish it was that, uh, you know, we could deploy it that way. It doesn't, uh, you know, if we go back to the, you know, the chart I introduced about the stack uh, you have the SSD, the operating system, the file system, the, the database, the application. Uh, this actually needs to be integrated further up the stack, really, to, to, optimize, um, to optimize that. So um, the, yeah, the way it's delivered is with a software vendor or with a, uh, you know, in a uh, custom application. 
Um, certainly, we're looking at uh, you know working with partners on ways that it can be delivered in an, uh, an appliance type of uh, formats where you can just have everything working and um, in a turnkey environment. That's becoming more popular type of setup. But no, it doesn't doesn't actually work uh, embedded in the SSD. It has to be uh, integrated into the software stack itself. Okay. Sure. Uh, one comment, Thanks. Steve, uh, on that regard is that. Uh, in the context of cloud, for example, we have another product which is doing the automation of deployment and orchestration. Uh, so, for example, if you're running in a cloud-based environment like Amazon, even a private cloud like OpenStack, uh, the actual provisioning and setup of the entire stack, including the SSD, and Amazon is using a, a SSD based on Fusion AO, which is now a Sandisk company, uh, you basically get the experience of an appliance uh, uh, pretty much. So it's all integrated from an end user perspective. You just push a button and you get you know, the, both the gigaspaces part and the uh, integration with the flash disk uh, completely automated. That's a good point. Uh, when, when an application is enabled, there's really no additional setup required. So when, it, when it's enabled for Zeta scale, it, it would be a, a seamless deployment as you're describing. So uh, it may as well be embedded, but it's, uh, that's not actually how it would be deployed. Keep the questions coming. We have uh, two similar questions from Robert and Gordon <coughs> relating to the wear out limits or the lifetime or longevity of data stored in Flash. Gordon says, I hope you'll address longevity. I know that Sandisk makes a vault which claims a 100 year lifetime of data stored. Robert wants to know if you can address that wear out limit of Flash based SSDs. So, Steve, what do you have to say about that? That's, yeah, those are very, uh, very common concerns. Um, what we've seen is really in the evolution of, uh, of enterprise SSDs, uh, even if you, if you go back three years, I think there was a lot of uncertainty, right? Because, yes, it is a characteristic of Flash that uh, it has many wonderful attributes. Uh, as you use it more, it, um, you know, it has a finite life so of, of, of rights. So that, you know, in, in the land of IT, that's not a common, uh, that's not a common issue that uh, that you have to deal with. So there was uh, concern and what we would see <clears throat> is uh, is customers would overbuy, right? We would say if your workload looks like this, if it's very write intensive by this type of product, if it's very read intensive by this, and the read uh -huh. intensive read intensive would be less expensive. Um, and what we found is customers said, I don't know. You know, well sometimes it's read intensive, sometimes it's write intensive. So they would uh, err on the side of being conservative. And we, we, we saw a lot of, uh, you know, write intensive drives that could last for, uh, you, know, um, you know, just hundreds of thousands of writes over the, the course of the product, which is, a, which is a lot. What we found, though, is companies would then go back and you can very easily uh, take a look and see, okay, I've been using this for a year. Uh, how, how have I been using it? And we'd find people that um, thought they were hitting it pretty hard and they might have used 1% of the the right budget of the drive after a year or or 5%. And so we're seeing a really big shift of uh, customers just becoming more comfortable that there's plenty of endurance. These are going to long outlast the uh, uh, you know the the application and we're seeing a, a, and and they want to experience the the cost savings, right? As the costs come down, let's use this more broadly. Uh, right. And let's use the less expensive products. So we're seeing a, a pretty big shift. You know, that being said, you do have to know there are, there are certainly are environments, particularly caching types of environments, where mm -hmm. you will get a lot of rights, and so you do have to uh, to know it. But I think uh, the 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 server vendors, the storage vendors, even the the software vendors are becoming more uh, sophisticated and can help you understand what is the right uh, SSD for your for your application. And then as far as uh, – oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say there's got to be some combination of, of SSD plus, you know, good old-fashioned RAM plus um, archival storage that makes sense for your particular environment. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, and that actually brings up maybe it's a, it's a follow-on is around longevity. Um, you know, what we find in the – you know, there's different uses for flash. If you're in a, if you have it in your camera at home, that camera might sit on the shelf for months or even a year, right. and you may not, right. you may not touch it. But when you turn it on, you want your pictures to be there. That's not a common use in the enterprise. Um, <laughs> so, 
you know, generally, if 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 a drive is disconnected for an hour or a day, you know, you're not going to um, uh, you know, care as much about that data. But that being said, I think pretty standard is uh, standard spec, if you want to call it, is 90 days. So, um, uh, you know, if you um, if you uh, you know the, the drive is disconnected for 90 days, your data will still be there. But um, but once again, that's a pretty uncommon uh, use case for for an SSD in the in the data center. Well, you know, so really yeah, hasn't, hasn't been a challenge. Yeah. And I wanted to add maybe to this point is that what we're seeing is that, you know, both from cost and also performance perspective, the combination of the three, meaning the RAM, the flash disk, and the regular disk, uh, is probably going to, you know, give you the optimum. But then the challenge is how do you integrate them in a, in a way that wouldn't create too much complexity of uh, data transformation and data transition. And, and the slide that I showed earlier was actually uh, uh, talking about the fact that we can streamline that data transformation so we can have real-time uh, in RAM and disk completely seamlessly, in flash disk completely seamlessly, and also synchronized asynchronously with the slower disk devices, but from a user perspective, you get a full continuum without you know, dealing with that transitioning between one device to the other. And we kind of plug in the, you know, when to do that synchronously because it's fast, like in the case of a, uh, of a flash disk, and when to do that asynchronously because the transformation is going to be slower, uh, and you could also control the bed size and, and the latency yeah, from that respect. Yeah, what I what I find interesting is you know people who say, well, it's only going to last ten years. Excuse me, when was the last hard drive you had that lasted that long? <laughs> <laughs> and are you yeah. still using it? And if so, why? Because it's like fifty megabytes. So I mean, the, the, uh, obviously, um, yeah, you, your your mileage is going to vary, and the use cases determine you know what the right technology is for a particular case. But there are so many places that SSDs like this make so much sense for. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Let me squeeze in this one question from Diane who wants to know, what operating systems does ZS Scale software support, Steve? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. We, we presently uh, work with Linux operating system, and we're, uh, which covers a lot of use cases, particularly around these um, uh, analytics environments, but we're certainly working on uh, extending that to other other operating systems. Um, and uh, maybe just to squeeze in, you know, I see one other question here on the list, which is, you know, why why should I care about Zscale, right? What's the kind of the, the takeaway? And it's really it, it enables an application to achieve uh, really the highest levels of performance and scalability at a very attractive total cost of ownership. And when combined with uh, product or a solution like what Gigaspaces offers with their ZAP, uh, Zap Memory Extend, um, it, it enables efficient scaling, uh, cost-effective, and really, you know, how, how can you bring that real-time analytics benefit to more and more applications with by a reduced cost? So that, that's really the objective: is uh, you know, let's let's bring the world to to real-time analytics. And with that, we've run out of time. I, uh, an hour just flew by. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, for more information related to it, please visit the resource links you see open in front of you. And within the next 24 to 48 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Additionally, you can view today's event on demand by visiting informationweek.com slash events. Thank you for attending today's webinar, How to Increase Transactions Per Second with Flash Storage, brought to you by SanDisk and Information Week Financial Services. This webinar is copyright 2014 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned by, or copyrighted if that's the case, by SanDisk and Information Week Financial Services, who are solely responsible for its content, and our speakers who are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. On behalf of our guests, George Gilbert, Steve Fingerhut, Nati Shalom, I'm Michael Krieger. Thanks for your time, and have a great day. Thank you.